our faithful Elohim. That's the title of this sermon. In the, uh, in the country of Armenia in 1988, Samuel and Danielle sent their young son, Armand, off to school. Samuel squatted before his son and looked him in the eye. Have a good day at school and remember, no matter what, I'll always be there for you. They hugged and the boy went off to school. Hours later, a powerful earthquake rocked the area. In the midst of the pandemonium, Samuel and Danielle tried to discover what happened to their son, but they couldn't get any information. The radio announced that there were thousands of casualties. Samuel then grabbed his coat and headed for the schoolyard. When he reached the area, what he saw brought tears to his eyes. Armand's school was a pile of debris. Other parents were standing around crying. Samuel found a place where Armand's classroom used to be and began pulling a broken beam off the pile of rubble. He then grabbed a rock and put it to the side, and then grabbed another one. One of the parents looked at on and asked, what are you doing? Digging for my son, he replied. The man then said, you're just making things worse. The building is unstable, and tried to pull Samuel away from his work. Samuel set his jaw and kept working, and as time wore on, one by one, the other parents left. Then a firefighter tried to pull Samuel away from the rubble, and Samuel looked at him and said, won't you help me? The firefighter left, and Samuel kept digging. All through the night and into the next day, Samuel continued digging. Parents placed flowers and pictures of their children on the ruins. But Samuel just kept working. He picked up a beam and pushed it out of the way, and when he, then he heard a faint cry. Help! Help! Samuel listened, but didn't hear anything again. Then he heard a muffled voice, Papa. Samuel began to dig furiously, and finally he could see his son. Come on out, son. And the son said, no, let the other kids come out first. I know you'll get me. Child after child emerged until finally little Armand appeared. Samuel took him in his arms and Armand and said, I told the other kids not to worry because you told me that you would always be there for me. Fourteen children were saved that day because one father was faithful. How much more faithful is our Heavenly Father? Whether trapped by fallen debris or ensnared by life's hardships and struggles, we are never cut off from Yahweh's faithfulness. He is true to his character. He is reliable and trustworthy and can be counted on always. Here's a simple definition. Yahweh's faithfulness means that everything he says and does is certain. He is 100% reliable 100% of the time. He does not fail. He does not forget. He does not falter. He does not change. He does not disappoint. He says what he means and means what he says. And therefore, does everything he says he will do. Let's look at some of the key passages on Yahweh's faithfulness. In Exodus 34, verse 6. And Yahweh passed by before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. 
Know therefore that Yahweh thy Elohim, he is Elohim, the faithful Elohim, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. An Elohim of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. In Joshua 21 verse 45, There failed not aught of any good thing which Yahweh had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. Psalms 25 verse 10 says, All the paths of Yahweh are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. And as Psalms 89 verse 8 reminds us, O Yahweh Elohim of hosts, who is a strong Yah like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? These verses, when taken together, establish that Yahweh's faithfulness is not some minor or secondary part of his character. To say that Yahweh is faithful goes to the very core of who he really is. If he didn't keep his word, he wouldn't be Yahweh. If you took away love, Yahweh's character would be incomplete. Yahweh's love works with all the other attributes, like his justice, to produce the right kind of results. We can compare Yahweh's faithfulness to the oil in the engine that keeps the internal parts running smoothly. Yahweh's faithfulness means that each attribute in his character is working at full capacity all the time. When does Yahweh's love fail? Never. Because he is faithful. When is Yahweh less than holy? Never. Because his character is pure and he's always faithful to who he is and to what he says. Yahweh's faithfulness is at the core of his very nature. He is knowable. He is holy. He's the creator, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, just, just, a sovereign, unchanging, and loving because he is faithful to his own character. He never changes and any of his attributes. Paul drew on this truth when he wrote in the, to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was not very popular because he was urging his people to surrender to the king of Babylon. Now, then after that, we come to the book of Lamentations, which is really a collection of sad songs or laments. It's a mournful postscript to the book of Jeremiah. <laughs> Through the uses of five dirges or funeral laments, that correspond to the five chapters, Jeremiah reminds us that sin, in spite of all its allurement and excitement, carries with it heavy weight of sorrow, grief, misery, barrenness, and pain. The title of the book is taken from the first word in verse one, how. It could also be tra translated, alas, which was a characteristic cry of lament or exclamation. Jeremiah is wondering how all this happened. Everything was going so well and then this. Jerusalem had now been destroyed and Jeremiah, who is known as the weeping prophet, is in the dumps. As you come to Lamentations in chapter 3, we see that Jeremiah bears his heart, not holding back the depth of his despair. 
No prophet ever pleaded with her people in a more impassioned manner, and no one except Yeshua was treated with more contempt than he was. In the first 20 verses, the weeping prophet lets it all hang out. His language is real and raw. So let me summarize his nine complaints. Yahweh is angry. Jeremiah has seen trouble and he knows it's because Yahweh is upset with his people. Think about our nation today. Do you know they're going to build replicas of the tower, uh, the, the altar of Baal in New York Times Square and they're building one in, in, in London right now? Yahweh is upset with his people. I am the man who has been af seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Chapter 3, verse 1. Jeremiah is in the dark. Instead of seeing things clearly, Jeremiah feels the loneliness of darkness. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. Chapter 3, verse 2 and verse 6. Feels like Yahweh is against him. Because of Yahweh's judgment, Jeremiah feels that like Yahweh has turned his hand against him again and again all day long. Chapter 3, verse 3. In verse 10, Jeremiah compares, Yah compares Yahweh to a bear lying in wait, or like a lion ready to pounce on his prey. Verses 12 and 13 are very graphic. He drew his bow, bow and made me the target of his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. He's tormented mentally and physically. Jeremiah's pain is both acute and chronic. He feels his pain intensely and he can't find a remedy for it. Look at verse 4. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. In verses 15 and 16, he describes how his life is filled with bitterness, how his teeth have been broken, how he has been trampled in the dust. He can't find release. Jeremiah can't figure out how to escape the pain and anguish he feels. He is besieged and surrounded with bitterness and hardship in verse 5. Verse 7 says, He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. He feels like a man trapped in a maze. His prayers are unanswered. Verse 8, Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. This is a prophet saying this. People make fun of him. People tell jokes about Jeremiah and make fun of him all the time. We see this in verse 14. I became the laughingstock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. People are making fun of us too. He's ready to give up. After all that he has been through, he just wants to throw in the towel and to hang it up. We see his honest cry of despair in verse 17. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. His hope is gone. He can't forget his troubles because they amb ambush him at every turn. In verse 18 he says, My splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from Yahweh. As much as he tries to minimize his problems, he can't help but think about his affliction and his wandering and the bitterness that floods through his life in verse 19. When he remembers all that he has gone through, he understandably gets bummed out in verse 20. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. While Jeremiah experiences a lot of pain and agony, my guess is that some of you have the words to his song already memorized. 
Perhaps you are experiencing many of these same things and secretly wonder if Yahweh is really faithful. You feel like Yahweh is mad at you. You feel like you're in the dark. You feel like Yahweh is against you. You have mental and physical pain. You can't find release. Your prayers are not being answered. People don't understand you. You are ready to give up. Your hope is gone. While it's okay to be honest with Yahweh and express your real feelings, like Jeremiah did, it's not okay to stay there. Jeremiah had every reason to sing the blues and just pitch his faith in, but he didn't. He forced himself to think about Yahweh's character. In particular, he grabbed onto his faithfulness. Some of you may think that you can't help what you're feeling. I don't mean to, for this to sound harsh, but you don't have to allow what you've gone through to keep you emotionally entangled and spiritually sidetracked. Jeremiah understands your pain. Let's look at now at what Jeremiah latched onto when his world was falling apart. I want you to remember this because I'm telling you, our world is about to fall apart. Verse 21 is really the hinge on which the, this book and Jeremiah's life turns. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. While his outward affliction and inward turmoil pushed him towards despair, Jeremiah forces himself to bring truth to the forefront of his mind. Like a computer that defaults to certain settings, each of us have a despair de default. If we don't reconfigure our minds, we will slide down the slippery slope of discouragement and lament. Here's how it works. If Jeremiah is focused on those things that are, were filling his mind, he was going to be bummed out. Look again at verse 19 and 20. I remember my afflictions and my wanderings, the bitterness of the, and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. In order to break out of this pattern in cycle of despair, Jeremiah needed to be vigilant about what he allowed himself to think about. He brought other things to mind. He called them up from his hard drive between his eyes. And he made himself think about what was true in verse 21. Yet this I call to mind. What Jeremiah, what Jeremiah did was something we need to do as well. Because I'm telling you, for real, our world is about to fall apart. We need to encourage, we need to engage our will and purposely and deliberately focus on things other than our problems. Force yourself to remember truth. Recall a verse. Remember a time when Yahweh demonstrated his grace and mercy to you. Push Yahweh's faithfulness to the front of your mind, even when you don't feel like doing it. When you do, Yahweh will begin to restore hope to your life by crowding out the hopelessness that threatens to shipwreck your life. Now what did Jeremiah call to mind? What did he focus on while he was hurting? What did he look on, lock onto when he was trapped by all the rubble in his life. Verse 22 and 23 contain four phrases. Each one raises and answers an important question that we need to consider. Why doesn't Yahweh destroy me? This is not a theoretical question. We all walk closer to the edge than we think. There's a thin line between disaster and prosperity between joy and sorrow, between laughter and tears, between life and death. Here is Jeremiah's answer, because Yahweh's great 
mercies, we are not consumed. Chapter 3, the first part of verse 22. Why doesn't Yahweh destroy us? He could if he should, and he should. He could because he is Elohim, and he should because we are sinners. Our sins would consume us if it were not for his great mercies. The Hebrew word for mercies is kah sed, a word rich with meaning. It has within it the idea of loyal love. Of love that will not let go because it does not depend on emotion, but on an act of the will. Yahweh was sticking by his people that he had chosen. Yahweh loves us because he promised to love us and nothing can cause him to break his promise. As bad as things are, if it weren't for Yahweh, things would be much worse. That seems obvious unless perhaps it is. But we need to hear it again. If it weren't for Yahweh and for Yahweh's mercies, no matter how bad things are in your life right now, they would be much worse without him. How do I know Yahweh will keep on loving me? The second half of verse 22 gives the answer for this question. For his compassions never fail. I want you to notice the word compassions is plural. It's very unusual in English. In fact, my grammar checker didn't like the word because it had an S at the end of it. But Yahweh's compassions are plural because his mercy is intense and limitless. It comes in rolling waves from the very presence of Elohim. The rivers of mercy run fully and constantly and never runs dry. The word compassion comes from the Hebrew word womb, W-O-M-B, and shows us the gentle feeling of concern and care that Yahweh has for us. The word literally means to be moved in the heart out of love for another. Yahweh's compassion emanates from deep within him and floods our lives. He is moved in his heart when he thinks about you. When will Yahweh give me what I need? Verse 23, the first part, gives a word of hope for each of us to latch on to. They are new every morning. What if you woke up every morning and find your purse full of money? Your car full of gas? Your refrigerator full of food? Your youth and vitality fully restored? That's the way it is with Yahweh's compassion and mercy. You can never use them up. Do you remember the story of Yahweh providing manna for his people when they were in the wilderness? Yahweh sent it every day except for the Sabbath. The people were instructed to gather as much as they wanted because it would never run out. However, they weren't allowed to store it except on the day before the Sabbath. In order to drive home his point, Yahweh told them, if they tried to save it, the maggots would come and spoil the manna. They were to gather just enough for each day, eat, eat it that day, and then gather more the next day. This is how Yahweh taught his people to trust him day by day to meet their daily needs. This means at least two things. We never have to live on yesterday's blessings. They are new every morning. And Yahweh's blessings are never early, but they aren't too late either. They are new every morning. Learn this lesson. Yahweh's mercies come day by day. They come when we need them. Not earlier and not later. Yahweh gives us what we need today. If we needed more, he would give us more. When we need something else, he'd give us that as well. Nothing we truly need will ever be withheld from us. What is my hope? 
for living? This question is answered in the last part of verse 23. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah was rocked by the limitless supply of Yahweh's grace offered to him. Whatever hard things we go through, we must never doubt Yahweh's faithfulness. We are to celebrate his great faithfulness every day. Before I wrap up, I want to give you three practical ways that you can experience Yahweh's great faithfulness in your life. When you struggle, all of us experience hard times in our lives. Some of you are struggling with sickness or financial pressure or grief or even depression. Do what Jeremiah did when your mind was flooded with difficulties. Choose to focus on Yahweh's love, mercy, and faithfulness. He does not promise to prevent problems from coming into our lives, but he does promise to go through them with us. Can you do that right now? Call to mind what you know to be true. Yahweh is faithful. He will always be there for you. When you are tempted, some of you are faced with some incredible temptations on a daily basis. Did you know that because Yahweh is faithful, he will always provide a way out for you so that you do not have to give in to them? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, No temptation has seized you except that is common to man, and Yahweh is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. What tempts you? What's your fatal flaw? In what ways are you drawn to do something that you know is not right? Remember this, Yahweh's faithfulness will give you a way out. You do not have to give in. He knows exactly the limits of what you can bear. Yahweh's faithfulness is tied directly to providing us a way to say no to sin. When we give in to sin, it's because I focus on the attractiveness of the temptation rather than on Yahweh's faithfulness to deliver us from this situation. And number three is when you mess up, would you be ashamed for others to know everything you've said or done or thought in the last seven days or the last three months with the last five years. If you know yourself at all, you know how much you mess up and how desperately you need Yahweh's mercy. Yahweh gives to us when we sin and confess it before him because he is faithful. He never tires of extending forgiveness to us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. To say that Yahweh is faithful is to say that Yahweh is committed to you. He is steadfastly devoted to you and is looking to pull you out from under this rubble that we live in. Because he is faithful, he protects you as well. Yahweh has been faithful to us in so many ways, even when we don't see it. In our moments of fear, through our tears, we can see that you are faithful. You always been faithful to us. Thank you, Father Yahweh. In Yeshua's name. Yahweh bless.